Welcome to this special AMA episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast, episode 195. These are questions that are curated exclusively from members of our Facebook community, which you are welcome to join. You can find us over on Facebook at the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Let's dive right in. Our first question comes from Daniel, who asks, what types of support for neurodivergent students are most lacking on college campuses? So let's look at the types of support that are often missing for neurodivergent kids on college campuses. There's a lot of variability when it comes to accommodations at different colleges. One big gap is in the area of extended time on assignments. That is frequently not something that is offered. Here's another really important point. Students generally find themselves in the driver's seat when it comes to accessing accommodations at the university level. They are the ones who have to make the appointments for assessments in test centers or with tutors, and they have to handle that communication directly with their professors. So that level of autonomy can be really tough for kids, especially if they haven't had some of that responsibility in the past. Elizabeth Hamblett has been a guest on the podcast, and she talks a lot about this. You can find her on episodes number 90 and 163, and she offers a lot of really valuable insights. She is the author of the book, Seven Steps to College Success, A Pathway for Students with Disabilities, and she has a wealth of information that you might find really beneficial. I like to think about this idea as a gradual release strategy when kids are going through college. Even though college academic settings tend to offer less support, having a system that gradually fosters independence in neurodivergent students is essential because it is such a significant step in preparing them for transitioning into the workplace after graduation and helping them adapt to that world more seamlessly. So our next question is from Brandy, and she asks about choosing a bachelor's or master's program that is truly supportive neuro-affirming, and trauma-informed. I noticed that this question could be approached from two different angles, so I'll address both of them. First, if you're looking for a program focused on educating or supporting neurodivergent individuals, it's essential to look at the coursework really critically. For example, you want to consider whether or not the program really relies on approaches like Applied Behavioral Analysis, or ABA, because that is not always going to align with neurodiversity-affirming philosophies. You can look at the terminology that is used within the courses as well, which can give you some insight. So for example, does the program use person-first language, like people with autism, or do they use identity-first language, such as autistic people? Different terminologies can give us some of those clues about the program's alignment with neuro-affirming philosophies. Now, if you're a neurodivergent adult, looking for that inclusive educational experience for yourself, there are some different things to consider. So some universities offer specific programs catered to neurodivergent students. On episode 98, Emily Racklaw discussed Marquette University's support program. And even if you feel like those specialized supports aren't something that are necessary for you, a university that offers programs like this can naturally foster a more inclusive environment. Additionally, don't overlook the Disabilities Service Office. You can investigate what kinds of supports and accommodations they offer, and their approach can also give you a feel for how the university on the whole respects and meets the diverse needs of all of its students. So selecting a program is a really personal journey, and it's important to choose one that aligns with both your values and your needs. It might take a little bit of digging, but it's worth investing the time to find a place where you or the individuals you want to support will feel both understood and valued. Our next question comes from Alicia. And Alicia asks, what benefits, if any, does a twice exceptional diagnosis offer in small school districts where gifted programming is limited? And this brings up some essential points about the education of twice exceptional kids in smaller school districts. First off, having a twice exceptional diagnosis can definitely be beneficial. 
even in smaller school districts where gifted programming might be really limited, the diagnosis or identification acts as a tool for advocacy, and it can help in pushing for necessary accommodations or modifications in the learning environment to meet that student's needs. Additionally, having that diagnosis is really important for both self-knowledge and understanding by the student. It allows them and their families to better comprehend their educational and emotional needs, and it helps them to foster a supportive environment that nurtures their abilities and talents while also addressing their challenges. Now, in terms of availability of gifted services, it's true that having a twice exceptional diagnosis might not guarantee access to more resources or services. However, if such services are available, the benefits likely outweigh the drawbacks, and specialized support can make a significant difference in the educational journey of twice exceptional students and allow them to thrive both academically and socially. Our next question comes from Emma, and she asks, how do I discern between executive dysfunction that is due to autism and potential ADHD in my gifted and autistic daughter, and how should I communicate those concerns with her teacher? So it can definitely be challenging to differentiate between executive dysfunction that is due to autism or potentially ADHD, especially when they are layered along with high ability. The symptoms and signs of those conditions really overlap a lot, and that can make it somewhat like trying to untangle a ball of yarn as we try to figure that out. So let's consider why we want to differentiate between the two. It's essential to ask, what support or intervention are we aiming for? Sometimes putting a label on something isn't as important as understanding what the individual needs are and how to address them. So if your daughter needs support with executive functioning skills, whether it's due to autism or ADHD or a combination of both, the support that you're looking for is what truly matters. I do understand that having clarity with these diagnoses and causes can guide more targeted strategies and approaches. So communicating with teachers and pediatricians is really crucial. When you're talking to her teacher, it's important to be as clear and concise as possible. So you might say something like, I've noticed that my daughter is having difficulties with, and then describe the specific concerns, and then ask if the teacher has any insights or if they've noticed any of those patterns in the classroom. Giving the teacher the context and specific examples can be really helpful. So if she's struggling with transitioning between activities or forgetting instructions or having a hard time organizing her work, those are all essential things to mention. But remember, the solution is more directly related to the concern as opposed to the diagnosis. The goal here is really to create that collaborative relationship where you and the teacher are partners in supporting your daughter's needs. Mel has our next question, and she wants to know how she should respond to her ADHD child's constant complaints of boredom. She understands that ADHDers tend to have brain wiring that leads them to get bored more easily, but she also gets tired of feeling like her daughter wants her to be the one who comes up with all of the entertainment all the time. I have to admit, this question strikes a chord. Managing that repetitive chorus of I'm bored from an ADHD child is a genuine struggle. But we can start by remembering that I'm bored is kind of like a secret code and it can signal a lot of different needs or emotions. So they might be seeking engagement, or they might be feeling lonely or tired, or perhaps they're craving novelty, or just they're feeling a little out of sync with their surroundings. The more we can help our kids identify and sort through those on their own, the better. So one way to manage those complaints about boredom could be to have a prepared list of activities that could be chosen from when your child's feeling bored. But because unpredictability can often capture the attention of an adhd -er, you could make this process a bit more fun by adding a dash of novelty. So you could create an activity jar and fill that jar with different suggestions written on pieces of paper anything from drawing, reading a book, building something with Lego. When boredom strikes, your child can pull out a suggestion, which adds an element of surprise and spontaneity to the activity that is chosen. Um, and I'm sure there are even other ways that your child could integrate novelty into activities that may seem mundane. 
Another idea would be to consider the physical environment where your child spends time. So sometimes just a simple rearrangement of items in their space can make old things seem new and exciting. So for instance, make art supplies or books or games more visible and accessible so that their presence really invites that curiosity and exploration. We can change the environment by rotating items in and out or rearranging them occasionally, and that can help in refreshing their interest and make familiar items feel like new discoveries. And of course, the idea of body doubling or just being in the same room with your child while she chooses an activity to do and engages with it can sometimes help. Stephanie wants to know if there is a specific strategy or program that focuses on helping students improve their working memory. So improving working memory, which is the ability to hold and manipulate information over short periods, is a common goal for a lot of people. And there's a variety of strategies and programs that aim to help with this. You'll find everything from specialized apps like Lumosity and CogMed to various therapies and interventions that say that they can boost working memory. But when you dive into the research, it really suggests that these programs and tools can improve performance on specific tasks, but those results might not always translate too well to other areas or general working memory. It's kind of like getting really good at a specific game or puzzle. You'll master that particular task, but it might not necessarily make a huge difference in other areas of your life or studies. So speaking of games, though, incorporating certain ones into your routine can be beneficial. So games like chess or Sudoku or certain card games like Concentration, for example, can all be helpful. These games naturally exercise your brain's ability to hold and manipulate information and make them a fun and effective way to bolster that working memory. We should also consider developing personal tools and strategies like mnemonic devices, which are basically memory aids. So for example, you might create an acronym or a little song to remember information. Whatever creative method works best for you or your child. And let's not forget accommodations. Sometimes it might not just be about improving working memory directly, but also about finding ways to make tasks a little more manageable based on individual needs and abilities. Nicole wants to know about rejection sensitivity dysphoria, and she's curious to find out whether or not it is associated with being gifted or if experiencing RSD suggests a likelihood of having ADHD. So this is a really great question, and it brings us to an important discussion about rejection sensitivity dysphoria, aka RSD. This is a concept that has been getting some attention lately, but it's crucial to clarify something up front. RSD is not formally recognized as a standalone diagnosis in the mental health field. I recently had a conversation with some colleagues about this, and we were expressing our collective concern regarding the growing awareness and conversations around RSD without a lot of research and clinical consensus. Rejection sensitivity, or feeling intense emotional turmoil due to real or perceived rejection, can be part of a lot of different mental health challenges like anxiety or depression or ADHD, but it is not exclusively tied to any single condition. So for example, in conditions such as depression, people might feel feelings of guilt or worthlessness that may seem out of proportion for what's happening but that might make them more susceptible to feeling rejected or criticized. But this sensitivity is a symptom within the broader experience of depression rather than a separate idea like RSD. The narrative of neurodivergence also plays a part here. Being neurodivergent in a largely neurotypical world often involves navigating through misunderstandings and dismissals or feelings of not being fully accepted. But it is more likely that the cumulative experiences that build up make somebody more sensitive to those experiences. Episode 83 of the podcast with Brendan Mahan talks about rejection sensitivity, and we offer some additional ideas. And we're also planning another in-depth interview with Dr. Sharon Celine about how we can conceptualize and support rejection sensitivity, whether it's related to ADHD or something else. So you can stay tuned for that in the next few months. But the bottom line is, 
Rejection sensitivity can be attributed to a lot of different factors, and it is not necessarily an indicator of ADHD or any other diagnosis. Our next question comes from Maria, who asks about a highly sensitive person, or HSP, and whether or not that idea might mask a diagnosis of autism. And she also wants to know, do a lot of adults who are diagnosed with autism display HSP traits? So let's define the concept of being a highly sensitive person. It simply means that there are people who have heightened sensitivity to environments or emotions and experiences, which can be completely valid, but can also be attributed to a lot of different factors, including, for example, a person's upbringing or their current life circumstances or other psychological conditions. The research around HSP is definitely in its very early stages, but it is a term that a lot of people really relate to. I would say that it is possible for traits of a highly sensitive person to mask or overlap with those of autism. So sensory sensitivities, for example, are common in both categories. However, we can't really attribute high sensitivity solely to autism because that might just be an oversimplification. A lot of individual experiences with sensitivity are unique, and so that can all be influenced by a lot of elements beyond these labels. So ADHDers also tend to have heightened sensitivity to sensory stimuli and have trouble regulating emotions, which research correlates with differences in the limbic system structure. But an undiagnosed ADHDer or autistic person might really relate to that HSP description. The concern there is whether or not the HSP identifier prevents somebody from seeking out or getting other supports. Our last question for today comes from Paula, who asks, how can we support ADHD and autistic kids who are navigating gender identity while also ensuring that they receive well-rounded guidance, not just focused on hormonal treatments? So this is a really important question, and um, I think that it deserves our attention. We recently dug into this topic quite a bit on episode 189 with Julia Rakowski, and that might be a great resource to revisit for anyone who is seeking more comprehensive insights on supporting kids navigating gender identity questions. It's crucial to create an environment where these conversations can happen openly and freely. We want kids to feel heard and understood, and we want them to have the language and space to express their experiences and feelings. What we have to remember is that kids often get information from their friends, and a lot of times that information is not accurate, to say the least. So if you aren't sure about how to talk to your child about gender identity, just open the conversation and let them explore their ideas, and then maybe do some research together So you can help them to understand that gender expression has a wide range of what is considered normal, and the process of identifying what works for them is not always a quick one, and it doesn't have to be. A lot of parents have similar concerns about hormonal treatments, but no responsible doctor is going to rush into prescribing hormonal treatments to a child without a well-rounded approach. They're going to involve a team of health professionals, which will include mental health clinicians, and they're going to work together to determine the best steps for the child. As with anything, we have to weigh out benefits versus drawbacks and understand that experiencing gender dysphoria can have significant negative effects on a child's life, and we need our kids to feel comfortable talking about those feelings so that we can support them in the ways they most need. We want the approach to be holistic. And we want it to include their neurodivergence, whether they're ADHD or autistic or gifted or twice exceptional, as well as their gender identity and any other components that contribute to their personality. When we nurture an inclusive and supportive environment, our children are going to feel safe to embrace their identities with resilience and confidence. Thanks for joining me today for this AMA episode. If you would like to contribute a question for our next AMA episode, be sure to go over and join our Facebook group, the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast.
This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.